It's the week ending Saturday the 15th of April and this is the week unwrapped. In the past seven days we've seen fresh warnings that the British housing market is stagnating, Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson launching a failed bid for further sanctions against Russia and a bomb attack on Borussia Dortmund's team bus. But we're here to bring you some of the stories that passed under the radar this week. Big news not making headlines right now but with repercussions for all our lives. I'm Ollie Mann, let's unwrap the week. And with me today from the week's digital team are Jamie Timpson, Elizabeth Carr-Ellis and Holden Frith. And to start the show with his top pick of the week, it is Holden. What have you brought with you? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'll need you all to fasten your seatbelts, please. There may be turbulence ahead. How not to do a viral PR campaign there with footage filmed by Tyler Bridges inside a United Airlines plane in Chicago as airport security tried to remove a doctor who would not accept the airline's cash to leave voluntarily. Uh, Now, Holden, this is a a really compelling story, but it is one of the most viewed on our website, so you'd better have a damn good reason for flouting the format. The reason I brought it along is that I think that unlike most Twitter storms, it's actually been underplayed. The response has mostly been about United Airlines' reaction and really treating it in the way that you framed it as a, as a PR problem. Mm. But I think it's symptomatic of something much deeper. And, and that's the gap between how companies talk to us in their advertising and in their Instagram accounts and in their packaging increasingly, as if they're trying to be our best friends and they're on our sides. And then sometimes the mask slips and we see the enormous indifference they have towards an individual customer. And this was about basically prioritising profit over a customer's well-being, wasn't it? Talk us through the story, what happened if if you missed it. So um, United Airlines needed to move some of their staff to a different destination so that they could staff plane coming back. So they needed the space on the plane. The paying customer was in the way of that operation. He was an obstacle. He was removed quite violently, as we've heard. And I think pushing this, this sort of analogy to the next level, that sense, the individual being powerless in the face of authority, mm. it creates the sense of impotence and rage that has paved the way for the abandonment of mainstream politicians who seem to be making these same kind of empty, hollow promises and then governing in a very impersonal and authoritarian way. When okay, they come to power. so you've got a thesis and that's yeah. interesting, but you can't really expect that United Airlines are going to advertise with this image and say, <laughs> buy a ticket on our plane and we won't treat you with respect. Of course their advertising is going to say one thing and sometimes, in fairness to that company, Sometimes, only occasionally, their delivery of that service isn't going to meet up to what they're promising. Sure. And likewise with politicians, they want to paint the boldest possible, the most optimistic possible picture. The problem is, I think, just the huge gap between those two pictures and the fact that the company or the politicians don't seem to care all that much and they don't expect to be caught out and they're they're not trying hard enough. Right. Railing against capitalism, this is very much your area, Jamie. (laughs) I'll hand the mic to you. I mean, it is symptomatic of the kind of big bad face of capitalism in in that example. But I think also the good thing has been that social media has democratised this whole situation. So in the past... So everyone gets angry. Yeah, yeah. but in the the past, you could get to a stage where that would happen. People would be like, oh, I was on the flight last week and it was really bad. And then five people wouldn't fly United Airlines. Mm. Now you're looking at... 20 million people that are thinking, hey, hang on a minute, do I want to really want to be flying with United Airlines? You've only got to look at Pepsi last week. The whole social media overhaul of capitalism in that sense has been really beneficial because now it is a way to get people's words out and it is a way to kind of fight back, I think. But then also, you know, again, to speak in praise of capitalism here, probably what will happen if that happens is United Airlines will drop their seat price, you know, rather like Air Malaysia after having to fatal plane accidents in a year. They're they're now an airline that people probably assume A, is quite safe to fly because they've had really rigorous safety checks and B, is cheaper. But that's a question for you about whether or not you 
prioritise cheap flights or flying with people that agree with your values. But isn't it going to be cheaper flights and better customer service? They're not going to repeat not this for incident. everyone. Elizabeth. It's an outlier. United Airlines acted abominably. It was terrible. But it's not fair to tar their entire airlines of one situation that's happened. So because Twitter gets its knickers in a twist and goes berserk, suddenly this airline shouldn't do well. All those people whose jobs rely on it... But I think it does speak to something of the culture of the company. If their first line was to offer a certain amount of money, I think it was, it got up to $800 for a 24-hour delay for this doctor to get the next flight. It does tell you something about the culture of that company and maybe more broadly, if the next level to go to is to call in uniformed men to drag this doctor off the plane while he's bleeding out of his mouth. Like the, there would have been a, a different way of handling it, which is just to offer a bit more, like essentially to auction off, make an announcement over the PA, will anyone get off for $1,000? Will anyone get off for $1,200? If you're going to put this towards politics then, if you're saying people are getting so angry about one situation, then there's no hope for anything. If you're saying a huge Twitter storm over one thing... Mm means the whole system's ruined. But I think this is an extreme example of something that we feel more broadly. Listen, when I was trying to find this uh, clip and listening to it rather than, than watching it, it, it actually made me think of uh, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and the torture chamber that Douglas Adams dreams up called the Total Perspective Vortex, mm. uh, where they play you the screams of the previous victim as, as you're waiting to, uh, to go in. The way the Total Perspective Vortex is meant to work is that it reveals to you the vast extent of the universe and your utter insignificance in relation to it. And I think on a small scale, trying to phone a bank, trying to get through an airport, offers a similar kind of experience. It reveals to you your relative insignificance in this sort of big machine we all live in. And that's not something we really like to be reminded about. I think it's very bad if you start saying, but I feel little and small, so therefore the whole system has to change. I think this is the big problem with the world today is everybody's going, everything has to change for me. I want everything to change because I'm not happy. It's how we've got Brexit. People are not happy with their own individual situations. So they all turned around and voted Mm. to leave the EU, regardless of all the good things it's done. I think that's kind of my argument, actually, that that the sense of of disengagement is what paved the way for Farage, Trump, Mm. Le Pen. Like if you listen to the world Trump described in his inaugural speech, it sounds very much like the world in which... A doctor will be dragged screaming off a plane. Well, hold if on you a listen minute. to the hold if you minute. listen to the world that Obama <laughs> describes, it doesn't sound like that. But more people felt they lived but in Obama, Trump's world. What Obama than did so well was mask the gap of inequality racially, socioeconomically across America. There was the, there has been and it always it has been a kind of huge gulf in inequality. And I think that's the question of the if rise of populism. This old man was taken kicking and screaming off a park bench in a public space by the police. Then yes. But actually, we are talking about a private company's private aircraft, which he's paid a few hundred dollars I can't to fly on. People are doing PR for United Airlines. No, no, I'm not. I absolutely can't believe. I'm, that. I'm not. I'm just saying his perspective was: it's my right to sit here because I bought the seat. And actually, it's his terms and conditions of the airline to sit there because he bought the seat. But it isn't the same as being in a public space, is it? And sometimes I think the outrage you're describing, Holden, you know, I'm so angry because I can't get through to my broadband supplier. Well, switch broadband suppliers. That's your right. Your right is not to have your call answered. You've chosen a cheap broadband we don't want to, But we also don't want to turn into a world where we're just saying, what's our rights? What's our rights? What's our rights? You know, I have a right. It's well, like we that- have turned into a world where everybody's going, that's my rights, that's my rights. Of course, that's my but rights. that's what we don't want. So in this situation, what they could have done was, yes, of course, by all means, that if you have an issue with the way that they did that, start your own airline, have your own rules. <laughs> I'm not saying like, that. Like, that's, that's the obvious answer. But what I'm saying is, is that they could be they could be much more courteous. They could have not dragged him out. They could have also made it m- more obvious the way that they'd picked those four people. Because the key thing is, is that they weren't going to pick the frequent flyers, were they? They weren't going to pick the first class people. And this they bloke was 70 gonna, years old, which was not really yeah. the number one choice. And like, yeah. But that's the thing is that, yes, by rights, they were perfectly in their rights to do what, to do what they did. But we don't want to live in that world. We don't want to be in a situation where people can't be courteous to one another and get what they need through it. And what about, if I may just steer this conversation back onto my own tangent here, this issue of public space versus 
private space because a a lot of people don't seem aware that uh, for example office blocks you know when they're built by private companies aren't public space they feel like it when you're standing outside the Pret-a-Manger downstairs but they're not you can't hand out political leaflets you can't take a picture without permission and b in the digital space which we're in now a lot of stuff that people think is their data has actually been uploaded to the cloud all of my tax returns are on google drive if that company goes bust, which I know is highly unlikely, but if they do, I won't have access to it. People aren't that educated, are they? And what's private and what's public and what's owned by a corporation? And I, there was another outburst of anger when people read more carefully than they previously had the Instagram terms and conditions a year or so ago and noticed that Instagram actually has the right to use any picture you take for any commercial purposes it pleases. Mm. It may have changed that afterwards, I think. But I think people do feel they're just losing control over a lot of either decisions they feel are theirs to make or property they expect is theirs. And to suddenly find out that a big company based in California, which may or may not be subject to UK rights, can do pretty much what it likes with your most treasured photographs is actually quite a disconcerting thought. OK, well, my script, which is hosted by Google Drive, has skipped on to the next section. Sorry, Sergey, I'll move on. Uh, Elizabeth, you're up next. What do you think this week will be remembered for? I think this week will be the week we all have to learn to be prepared. Scouting is all about giving young people a chance to have an adventure. And I believe that all young people have that right to an adventure. This could be a first time at camp, first time away from home, or trying out a new adventure-based activity. Whatever it is, adventure is at the heart of what we do. Adventurer, broadcaster, chief scout and reluctant self-promotionist Bear Grylls there in a recruitment video for the scouts. Uh, Elizabeth, there are more kids dib-dib-dibbing than ever before, but, according to this video, they are struggling to find enough leaders. Yeah, and they're not quite sure why. And I have to admit, I have to put my hand on my heart here and say, at first I thought... Well, you've got Bear Grylls involved. You know, what sort of role model is that putting out? What sort of message is that putting out to people? No wonder they don't want to get involved. But actually, <laughs> What do you mean? I want to dig a little deeper into that flippant comment. <laughs> What's the problem with Bear Grylls as a role model? Because at first I thought, OK, he's former SAS. He goes on TV and shows people how to kill things to survive, how to extract water from elephant poo to survive. Do we really want our children learning these skills? I, I think the answer to that is yes, isn't it? It's just that maybe maybe parents feel they can't compete. This is the thing. I had my liberal, I'm not a parent, but I had my liberal, the youth of today, hat on. But actually talking to some scout leaders, which I've done over the last couple of days, I've just discovered that some of my friends are scout leaders. I never knew this before. <laughs> some of my best friends are scout leaders. <laughs> talking to them has completely changed my mind. And I now think, come on, parents, step up and start getting involved in Scouts and leading these because we have a whole generation coming up who want to learn the things that kids should be learning about that should be going outside. They should be learning about the countryside. And we have nobody being role models to show them how good the countryside can be, how good adventures can be. Instead, they're sitting in the house with Xbox. Hold on. And then Hold, parents I, complain am, about kids sitting in the house with am, Xbox. Am I, am I the only... We offer Xboxes now as well. <laughs> am I the only parent with a microphone here today? I think I am, yes. OK, well, can I just p suggest that possibly it's because people are too stretched for time. It's not that they don't want... They want the Scouts to exist. They want their kids to have that experience. But as a mum or dad, you do not have the time to go and volunteer in the evening because life is ever more demanding. If only there was some solution to having more time over the course of a week. I think this might be Jamie previewing his story from later. <laughs> You're not allowed to do that. <laughs> I had very little contact with scouts as I was growing up. I had no, I didn't really know anyone that did it. It just wasn't really a thing in my like sphere, as it were. Which was it? Was that London? S yeah, South East London. Yeah, I'm guessing from yeah. the accent. Well, that, I mean, that's another point, isn't it? Urban yeah. kids in particular should be doing things like this. Yeah, and I think actually I would have turned out in a very different way. I'm absolutely cat handed. Can't make fire. Can't really hold myself upright. You shock us. But I do think that having read up about it this week, part of the issue, unfortunately, I've seen lots and lots of comments and stuff is the worry of men hanging out with kids 
and so one you know strand of things that i had seen was there was a, a recent danish film called the hunt which has mads mickelson as a kindergarten teacher who ends up a kind of world falling apart because the five-year-old girl who has a crush on him basically makes up that he performed the lewd act in front of her and i saw someone reference the film in the comments under the guardian article and just said i would never work with children like after seeing that yeah, I mean, that is an issue, isn't it, which we should address, which is that there has been paedophilia in the Scouts. That's one of the reasons that they brought in Bear Grylls as a kind of celebrity ambassador to deflect attention from some of the negative news around the Scouts. Now, albeit most of the stories to do with that were from the sort of 70s, 80s and early 90s. It's not been that recent. I mean, unfortunately, there are always one or two bad apples. But generally, you'd imagine that the Scouts is now quite a safe place to put your children or as safe as anywhere, as safe as a school or a church or whatever. But... For the parents who want to volunteer, they know they're going to have to go through ever more rigorous testing of essentially whether or not they're safe around children, and that makes people feel nervous. The scout leaders I talked to said the testing wasn't the problem. They were like, you have to do your criminal background checks, that's it, it's fine. One of them, bless him, he has four because he belongs to four different types of groups, and he's had to have four criminal background checks. He says it's the little things like... A scout leader is not allowed to take a child home in his car at the end of a meeting Mm. unless it's his child. He could go to that group and take a child home, his friend's child home. As a parent, he's quite able to do that. As a scout leader, he can't. If he does take children home, it has to be in a group. And the last of the group has to sit in the back of the car. It is the little regulations like that that he says has made it so difficult. I think as well it's... it's not just the rules and regulations it's the sense of stigma maybe that hangs around people who are volunteering so I I think it would put me off putting myself forward for something like that the the, I mean I don't have children so it maybe it would be a slightly odd thing for me to do no but But, I mean in a way it it makes sense that people without children would doesn't it yeah but I don't think I would volunteer partly because I would feel I might come under suspicion of something. Not even necessarily that I might be falsely accused, yeah, just yeah. that there would be the sense of, oh, what's, why is he involved? Yeah. In, I in think this? also there's an issue about how we see volunteering in society at the moment. And actually it's seen as something that isn't a crucial facet of people's lives. I think if it was more a, a, of a part of flexible working, so if employers promoted volunteering as part of your working week, we could end up in a situation where people did have, there were enough scout leaders. It was seen as a, as a kind of, as a thing that people did alongside their daily. And also it promotes all of the skills, dealing with children especially, that are really important in workplaces. Lots of arguments at work are very similar to the arguments that I had when I was five. Lots of, like, <laughs> lots of ways of de-escalating tension in a uh, like child environments could be so perfectly used in a working environment but people don't make the link there's not that link now well it's back to what we were saying in the previous story in a way isn't it it's the public private partnership thing if, if corporations understood that value that you're outlining and used it as part of their promotional strategy to say this is who we are and we encourage people to get involved in the community then you can see that could be mm. a positive thing I but was- Perhaps they're suspicious of getting involved with kids for the same reason that you as an individual might be. Yeah, it's it's easier to do something safer and or just to sort of make a donation perhaps. But but I do think Cubs and Scouts can be really useful. I was a, a, a Cub and actually didn't graduate to the Scouts because something similar to what we're talking about happened in that there was, there was a, um, a couple who ran the, the Cubs. They were really committed, really good. They retired. Nobody really wanted to put themselves forward the guy who did his heart wasn't really in it and it it all just sort of began to fall apart and went from having a long waiting list to being half empty without somebody who's really prepared to put in quite a lot of effort those sorts of problem solving activities fall away and I think society is the poorer for it but it's not just in voluntary organizations such as the scouts if you look at primary schools There is a dire shortage of male primary school teachers for the same reason. It's something like 30,000 male primary school teachers compared to... And as a primary school teacher, you haven't got to dress up in a ridiculous outfit. There's not even that. You don't have to dress up in a ridiculous outfit. You don't have to look after your woggles. So I find this very bad after my feminist rant a few weeks ago. I'm now starting to think, hang on a minute. What about the poor blokes? Where are the role models for these boys going to come from? Girl Guides is purely for girls. Or for boys who identify as girl, it's purely for girls. Scouts isn't anymore and hasn't been for about 25 years. It's a male-female thing. So I just feel that perhaps boys are being neglected in this very much. 
there's never been a suggestion that actually maybe they should be professional. If people have the money and want their kids to be involved in it, but can't be bothered to give up the time or maybe don't have the time, Mm. if only there was a way we could have more time in our week, then surely the logical thing to do is to start paying. So have the scouts as a as a as a paid for professional thing that you go and send your kids to. No. Okay. because then you're just going to start getting elite groups. You will get elite groups in Kensington who do much more exciting things because their parents can afford to do it. It will go from being romps in the countryside to skiing in Aspen. (laughs) Okay, Jamie, what romp have you brought with you today? Could it be, thank God it's Thursday? (laughs) The thing is, everyone loves a bank holiday, right? So it'd be like, we could do this every week. I mean, who's going to argue against that Like on TV? like You you really are going to look pretty stupid, I think. Who's going to argue against a weekly bank holiday? Let's find out. Uh, That was Tom Mills speaking on The Fix, a discussion show available on YouTube. Uh, Jamie, you want a four-day week, do you? Yeah. Well, Well, you've got one. We're in one. I know. I thought it's very topical this week and next week. week. Yeah. Yeah. So what's the problem? I know. If only I lived in these two weeks, I'd be sorted. (laughs) Um, It's actually not that new an idea. So it was suggested by Caroline Lucas and Jonathan Bartlett, who are the two leaders of the Green Party. They fleshed out the idea on Andrew Marr last Sunday. They haven't said whether or not it'll be a manifesto pledge, but um, it certainly looks like they're looking at bringing it into fruition. So bring a weekly four-day week? Well, so it would just be a three-day weekend. So you'd work four, four days. They're saying that it would be 32 hours. So a, thir- so a 32-hour week rather than a 40-hour week. Although, of course, in law, you would imagine that maybe it would still remain at a 40-hour week, but they would just shorten it down so you'd have more time. But it, that can, But when it's, when it's in law, that'll be a, a, a thing that can be discussed if, if and when it happens. Actually, it's not a new suggestion at all. Winston Churchill, our favourite former prime minister, said, hopefully that technology would give us... Uh, in 50 years time the working man what he's never had four days work and three days fun it actually does also address the kind of problems of British productivity we're now in negative productivity how does it address the problems of productivity by when, giving one day off I mean this is a bit difficult for you because you don't probably work in an office nine to five but very if, you dare could, you. if you could imagine I never stop working if, <laughs> if you could imagine that productivity on a Friday afternoon drops off hugely mm. I've always been a big a, a big kind of fan of the notion and the idea that people when they are given a certain set length of time they stretch the amount of work that they do over that amount of time in America where it's been trialed in a couple of technology companies they talked about how actually people's productivity had increased because in the same way that you do when you know you're going away on holiday you get more work in because you have to get it done in that certain amount of time so people are more productive um, if yeah, they... but, okay, maybe in an office, maybe when you've got a silly job like this. But I mean, if you're working in a factory making stuff, you, there's only so fast you can work, but, isn't there? Yeah, and so if there's only so fast that you can work, what it actually does is mean that people have to hire more people, which then means that more people get employed. I'm telling you, mate. Four-day week. <laughs> Holden, um, sw- Sweden. are you going to grant Jamie a four-day week? Has um, he made the case? No, mm, not, not beyond <laughs> the next two weeks. <laughs> Sweden's also tried this, and it's done a couple of trials, and they've been various results the most recent one was in a care home and well if there's one place you really don't want the staff to not be there for a day <laughs> that seems like well, a poor experiment so, so they did have to hire uh 25 extra people in order to cover the missing grand um they saw some benefits so um less um absence for sickness that went down by about 10 percent but the extra costs of hiring those extra staff were deemed to be uh, were deemed to outweigh the benefits but the sort of politics of this became clear in the way that this trial was reported so in the guardian the headline was sweden sees benefits of 6 hour working day and in the telegraph it was sweden abandoned 6 hour working day scheme because it's just too expensive <laughs> <laughs> elizabeth utah had exactly the same when it tried it it tried this for 3 years Utah. Um, Utah, yeah, the state of Utah. I don't in think anywhere the... in America was prepared to try giving anyone more than about two <laughs> days holiday a year. They, d- they did it for three years in public workers. At the end of three years, they went back to five-day week saying they hadn't made the savings. There is an argument about that. Some said it was done for political reasons with a new governor, I think it was, came in. But basically, there was not the economic imperative there to continue <clears throat> doing this. What about a fifth day, which is a bit more flexible? I mean, again, referring to our conversation last week around the robots taking over, 
there's a lot of possibility to work from home for a lot of people now or to be effectively doing their job whilst on their mobile phone sitting on a beach. What about the story we were just discussing and the need for volunteers? Is, is there a way to just be a bit more fluid about what you do on that fifth day? I do think employers now have to recognise that technology has changed so much since the eight-hour working day was implemented and people can do their job quite happily at home. Our, our working week hasn't changed since the Second World War. You know, between like the 1870s. What, journalists? Whatever. You'd all be in the pub for two hours every day. <laughs> it's changed massively. Um, but like between 1870 and the Second World War, we went from 120 hour working week down to now what is 40. But we've been wedded to that idea. If you think about how different life was since, since 1945, we've been wedded to that two day, five days on, two days off nothing and no one has changed it yet i think also what's interesting is the kind of gender roles aspect of it if we had an extra day of the weekend it would mean that the more unpaid work could be shared within a household or even just across across genders because there's less of that like oh you know i've got to go to work so i can't do the washing up say or you know it's basically less spreadsheets more washing up it does depend a lot on the kind of work that people are doing so there was another Swedish trial at a uh, Toyota plant a few years ago where again they moved from eight hour days to six hour days and actually they found that productivity and profits both went up as a result of this and so they've stuck with it this was the only example I could find of a trial that has been deemed so successful for both workers and the company that it it stuck with it but uh, building cars is a pretty skilled but repetitive operation and I can see how you'd be able to do that more quickly and more accurately for six hours than you could over eight hours so there is a sort of win-win element there but I think where the output is more fixed or harder to measure it's going to be harder to convince a company that they're going to get the benefits out of adopting it. But I think the big elephant in the room is who's prepared to take a fifth of a pay cut? Because if you stop working one day, your pay's going to go down. Well, this is the answer, is that it has to be part of law, which means then that you are basically paying someone in time and money. So if you get, like, your normal wage for a four-day week, what you're actually getting is, instead of getting a, a promotion or anything like that, you're basically being given an extra day off and it, and it is it obviously it's political and it's about how we see the work life balance and all of those things but there is a huge positives to having that extra day amongst employers happiness because the way these trials were set up you didn't actually sacrifice any salary you were being paid the same for less work uh, which is why it's so surprising that the Toyota scheme actually ended up increasing profits and and profitability they were able to generate more from from less time but the green party are suggesting this that doesn't make it new story of the week as far as i'm concerned because uh you know what are the chances that the green party are about to be elected we're not going to have a four-day week in 10 years time are we i'm a big fan of this idea of the progressive alliance yeah that's not the criteria for choosing the most significant story of the week i think that in the future these kind of radical policy ideas things like universal basic income, things like the four-day week, they're getting spoken about in the kind of mainstream media more, more often. Things like even even just with the with this one in general, the four-day week, it was the Julia Rampin in the New Statesman saying, actually, you know, this isn't pie-in-the-sky thinking. These are actually hard-headed uh, ideas, business yeah, it insider. It is pie-in-the-sky thinking, though, isn't it? Do you really but think 10 years' time we're going to see it? I think, I think the fa- e- even the fact that we're discussing it, albeit because I've brought it in. But even the fact that we're discussing it in the same way that we are with universal basic income shows that people are reacting to this problem of, you know, 21st century Britain uh, declining productivity with radical economic thinking. And that's going to make things different. Things are going to change. And if you have a Friday afternoon free every week, remember to download The Week Unwrapped and listen to it then. And even if you're at work, try and squeeze it in. Uh, That is it from this week's edition. My thanks to Holden Frith, Elizabeth Carr-Ellis and Jamie Timpson. For more from The Week, why not visit theweek.co.uk. You can download our free iPhone app, The Weekday, or of course you can get the magazine direct to your door via theweek.co.uk slash subscribe and you can hear every episode of this podcast in the digital time capsule that is iTunes just hit subscribe there uh, or on SoundCloud Pocket Casts or your podcast app of choice I've been Ollie Mann our music is by Tom Morby and the producer is Matt Hill at Rethink Audio until we meet again to unwrap next week have a great Easter and goodbye